All right, welcome everybody to, to this week Autonomy Talks. Uh, this week is a great pleasure to have uh, Karen, um, Karen Leong, sorry. Um, and this is a great pleasure to, for two reasons. First, because Karen is in California, so it's very early for her in the morning. And also very appreciated since the uh, ICRA deadline got postponed <laughs> that she's here in spite of that, <laughs> uh, still giving the talk. So a bit more about Karen. Karen uh, is a PhD candidate at Stanford Autonomous Systems Lab uh, in, in Marco Pavone's group. Um, before that, she got a Bachelor in uh, Aeronautical Engineering and Mathematics at the University of Sydney, and then a Master's in Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford. Um, and her research focuses in uh, safe planning and control uh, for human-robot interactions. So when those robots actually come to our lives, how can they safely interact with the humans? And I'm really interested in what she, she's going to talk about. And also, fun fact, she already been in Zurich, even if we are not not in Zurich <laughs> right now, we are virtual, but so she, she, was, she was already there. Yeah. So whenever you want, Karen, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, cool, so welcome, thank you for being here. Um, today, I'll be presenting my research on using reachability analysis and temporal logic for safe and robust planning under uncertainty. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, so how many of you have experienced this uh, or seen someone experience this awkward situation when uh, trying to merge onto the highway? Um, you probably can't hear the sound, but there was a lot of beeping that was happening in this video. Um, so when you as a driver are trying to merge onto the highway, you are predicting what the other car next to you is trying to do, or especially predicting what they're trying to do in response to your actions, right? If you're going to speed up a little, is that car going to speed up or slow down? And a wrong prediction or a bad decision can lead to this awkward and potentially dangerous situation. Um, right, so um, if this is difficult for humans, imagine how much harder this is for an autonomous car or more generally a robot that is interacting with human agents. And for my research, I'm interested in these kind of interactive scenarios where a robot needs to uh, kind of interact with the human, um, trying to understand this, these interactions while staying safe is a very challenging problem to this field of human robot interactions. And so for my research, there's, there are two key questions that I'm you know, thinking about and we'll be talking about today. The first one is, how do we ensure safety without unduly impacting interaction performance? So on the one hand, you want to be able to interact with the humans, but on, but on the other hand, you want to be safe, right? So for, you don't like, you don't, you know, you could stand, you could wait by the side of the highway um, until there are no cars left and then merge onto the highway, but obviously uh, this isn't ideal. Now, the second question is a little bit more abstract, and it's how do we incorporate human knowledge when modeling interactions? So, you know, for going back to the kind of autonomous driving example, there's a lot of road rules that govern how, you know, the agents should interact. And when you're talking about interactions, there's also maybe a lot of human knowledge that we know that, um, that could help in trying to understand or provide structure to this interaction. And so the question is, how do we kind of translate this knowledge into the autonomy stack, which can then help downstream applications such as planning and control. So, um, and so for the outline of my talk, I'll be addressing these first two questions. And at the end, I will actually draw connections between um, kind of the things that I talk about in you know, points one and two and lay, lay down the groundwork for some interesting future directions. So the first part, um, you know, how do we ensure safety without unduly impacting interaction performance? Um, so, I'll, the, um, so for this part, I'll give you so, a brief overview on how safety is treated in kind of other works. I'll give an overview of what Hamilton Jacoby reachability is. Um, and, then, and then I'll go into the details of how we can use this um, Hamilton Jacoby reachability to create safe robot interactions. 
Okay, so you probably, um, hopefully you all know, like within your robot, you have the um, high level planner that tells your robot what to do. And then you also have the low level controller that tells the robot how to do it. So this might mean your controller is trying to track or trying to follow um, the desired trajectory that your high level planner is um, kind of outputting. So at the high level planner, a common way to treat safety is to simply add a collision avoidance term into the planning objective. So this might mean you could put some like potential fields around your humans or put a high cost when you get close to the humans. And this can incentivize the robot to, you know, keep that distance between itself and humans large. However, because it's a term in the planning objective, this actually competes with other planning objectives, such as, um, you know, minimizing time or maintaining speed. So although this can incentivize the robot to stay safe, it ultimately isn't treating safety in a strict sense. Uh, um, alternatively, you could go for a more conservative approach, which is to compute the forward reachable sets of the humans. So you propagate, um, do a, yeah, you propagate the states of the humans forward in time to create this kind of funnel in front of them. And you tell the robot to keep out of these regions. Um, and you do this at every planning step. You know, this, this can treat, like this treats safety more rigorously. However, um, you know, it, as you can see, you know, if you had a lot more agents, you know, the whole space might become invisible and this would be very hard for planning. And also for interactions, you do want to get close to humans, right? In order to interact and show intent and convey intent, you do want to get close to these humans. Um, and so forward propagation might be too conservative um, for human robot interactions. On the low level control side, um, remember this is to computing controls to track a desired trajectory. A very common way that safety is treated is to um, kind of do it reactively. So this means that your system will, um, you know, have a nominal tracking controller. And then when safety is violated or when your system becomes close to being unsafe, your system will switch to a backup safety controller. And this could be a kind of may come from a set of pre-computed emergency maneuvers. Um, it can it also can come from Hamilton Jacobi reachability ana analysis, which I'll talk about later. And the idea is that you will switch to this control that will take your system or your robot to a safe state as quick as possible. And for a lot of applications, this might make a lot of sense. But for human robot interactions, this could actually not be the best or be desired because one, you were completely throwing away the planning objective out the window, right? Because you are switching um, controllers, you are now ignoring what the planner wants to do. And secondly, this can be very invasive. So this could mean just an autonomous car slamming on the brakes in the middle of the highway. And while this may avoid a collision at the front, it might actually cause more collisions from behind. Uh, a less invasive approach is to compute the set of safe controls and pass this as a constraint to the broader optimization problem. Um, you might be familiar with say uh, ORCA, Optimal Reciprocal Collision Avoidance. And in that work, they were able to avoid collisions in a very large crowded environment. However, they assumed that the humans had like they shared equal responsibilities in avoiding collision. So essentially they, they um, basically knew what the human's policy was when they, when they computed these safe control sets. But again, in human robot interactions, there's a lot of uncertainty in what the human's going to do. And, and also you don't know the human's policy. And so it is quite, um, and so, um, so that's why it, ensuring safety for human robot interactions is very challenging. Um, I also just quickly add that um, there are other works that actually combine the planning and control problem into one massive nonlinear optimization problem, um, such as these works on the bottom right here. And they applied and they did this uh, approach when looking, when pushing, uh, or when like operating at the performance limits of the car. Um, in this case, it was an autonomous car. And while this was quite effective, um, ultimately, um, 
the, the scenarios that we're looking at were kind of deterministic and static, whereas what we're interested in are like very stochastic and, um, and like the, the obstacles are moving. And so what I'm proposing in my work is that one, the planner should, the planner and controller should share the same interpretation when it comes to safety. In particular, this should be done through the lens of Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis. And, and, and so if we do this, your high level planner will be able to understand when your safety controller can and cannot succeed. And therefore it will avoid regions where it will know that your low level controller would fail. And then from, on the other side of things, your low level controller is able to kind of maintain knowledge and an understanding of what your planner wants to do. And therefore it will be able to just minimally deviate from the desired trajectory, just enough to stay safe. Um, for the interest of time, I'll be focusing my work on like the low level control. Um, I'll touch a little bit on like the planning side of things, but if there's time and interest, I, I'm more than happy to talk about um, kind of the, the things at the planning level. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I'm not really sure if people are familiar with Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis, um, but I'll just give a quick overview of what it is, just enough to understand the details of what I'm proposing. So at a very high level, Hamilton Jacobi reachability allows us to answer the following question. Suppose there's an avoid set T that you want to avoid in the future. So this could be a hole in the ground. So you don't want to fall in this hole and um, it could be like a tree. So you want to avoid this set T sometime in the future, say in the next five seconds. Then what is the set of states that you should avoid now to avoid yourself from entering this set T? And what you can do is propagate backwards in time and then compute this avoid set A. And you could imagine that the set A would be something a little bigger than T and the shape of it would really depend on your dynamics. To give a more concrete example, um, you have, um, suppose you're on a bicycle and you are moving towards a tree. And then the question is like, at what point where no matter how hard you break and how hard you swerve, you are always going to hit that tree, right? And you can compute kind of maybe intuitively see that the set would actually look like this little sideways teardrop um, where if you were inside the set and moving at a certain speed, there's no way you can avoid hitting the tree. And this is what we call, if you look at, read up on the kind of Hamilton Jacoby reachability literature, this is what they call a reachable tube. But for the sake of this, um, kind of presentation, I'll refer it to like the unsafe set or the avoid set. And we can also reason about this or yeah, think about this set, even when there's a worst case disturbance that's being applied to, um, to your system. So imagine now you're on your bicycle and there's a huge gust of wind blowing behind you. Um, we're still able to do this computation under the worst case disturbance. Okay, so given this uh, kind of intuition, we can actually apply this in the context of human robot interactions. And so now the question becomes, um, how far does this or like, where should the human be so that if the human did everything they could to collide into you, so maybe the human driven car like swerves into you, like how far do they need to be so that the robot will still have an escape maneuver. Right. So in this picture, as long as that human is um, outside the avoid set, so this red set, as long as the human's outside it, the robot knows that no matter how hard the human turns and like tries to crash into it, the robot has a control policy that allows it to um, escape and avoid a collision. Now, a question you might be thinking is, um, how do we compute this avoid set, right? I've been talking about this set, but I haven't really talked about how we actually compute it. Well, I'm not going to go into the details, but the bottom line is that you can compute this set by finding a solution to the Hamilton Jacobi Isaac's partial differential equation, which is done offline. And the solution is V, 
uh, the solution V is what we call the value function. And the zero sublevel set of this value function is the avoid set that I've been talking about. So, um, so ultimately the goal for Hamilton reachab uh, Jacobi reachability is we wanna keep our value function non-negative because being negative means you are inside the set and positive means you're outside. So the goal is to kind of yeah, keep this value function positive um, for the entire interaction. Cool. Um, so uh, the next question then is like, well, what do you do when your system is close, when your value is close to zero, right? Meaning your system is close to being unsafe under the worst case disturbance. Um, as you can see here, this is a contour map. So this might be what your value function looks like, um, at least in a 2D slice. Um, so again, you, you want your system to avoid this pink region or red region here. We can add maybe an extra layer of safety. So we can add a tiny little buffer zone, say by, by this, um, these dotted lines here. Okay. Um, and so we have, suppose your system is just operating as it is but you know, your value function changes over time as your state changes. And along this kind of uh, trajectory where you're operating normally, right? you would be often using like a nominal tracking controller. So maybe um, if you're familiar, I'm like LQR or just solving a quadratic program at each um, control iteration. But then at some point your value gets close to the boundary, right? You are close to being unsafe now. So what should you do? Ideally, you want to increase your value function as much as possible. So you would want to move into the direction of the gradient, right? Because that increases your value as quick as possible. But obviously, you can't do that right away because you are constrained by your dynamics. Now, assuming the worst case disturbance is being applied to your system. So imagine there's a D star that's being applied. Looking at your dynamics, there's like a certain direction that you could move in given a particular control. And so this is indicated by this green cone here. So these are the directions that your system can move in. So what, we're, what we propose in our work is this safety preserving control set. So basically it's a set of controls that um, ensure that your value function is non-decreasing over time. And you could see that this would mean that you, you wanna choose controls that where you would move only in that dark green region um, shown, shown on the left, right? Because if you move in, the, in these directions here, your value would not be decreasing. Um, and so this is what we call the safety preserving control set. And this is kind of just remember this concept um, in my next, over the next few slides. And the um, kind of the optimal approach here is what we call the optimal collision avoidance control. And it's the one that maximizes your uh, value function over time, right? You wanna choose the maximizer. Um, and this is, um, as I mentioned a few slides ago, where the common approach is to switch to an optimal collision avoidance control. Um, and, this is, and so this is what it is for Hamilton Jacobi reachability. Um, so here you would be running your nominal control. And then when you hit the boundary here, you would switch and essentially throwing away the planning objective by switching. And I'll also com I'll compare the effect of using this controller versus what I propose um, in a few slides. Cool, so um, just to make this more concrete, um, you know, we have, uh, yeah, so we have, so what I'm proposing is a minimally interventional HJ safety preserving tracking controller. So what this means is we have our nominal tracking controller, right? So usually this might mean you're minimizing your tracking error subjected to some control dynamics and state constraints. And what we're proposing is that when your value is close to zero, so less than epsilon, where epsilon is small, we will activate this uh, safety preserving control constraint um, to your optimization problem. Uh, we have a slack variable here just to ensure that your optimization problem is feasible. And then we also throw the slack variable. Um, we, want it, we want the slack variable as small as possible. So we throw it into the objective here. Okay, so now 
um, we tested this in a traffic weaving scenario, um, pretty much the same one that we I talked about at my very in, in that video that I first showed you. So in this setting, you have two cars, a human driven car and an autonomous car. Um, so yeah, this is the human driven car and this is the autonomous car here. They start side by side and then they have to swap lanes in a short amount of time. So in our previous work, we um, developed a traffic weaving probabilistic planner. And so the robot would be making predictions ab about what the human may do next. And they use these predictions and the robot use these predictions to inform its um, pla planner. And this was done in, in our paper back in 2018. And what we're proposing is that if the human did something unexpected, like swerve into the robot, um, or, or you know, does something really quick that the robot didn't have time to react, that the, the robot's planner didn't have time to react to, this reachability kind of based safety that I was proposing in my last slide would allow the robot to deviate just enough to stay safe because of this safety constraint, but it's still optimizing to minimize tracking performance. So it will still continue to follow its desired trajectory as planned. Um, okay, so hopefully this setup makes sense. Um, so yeah, we tested this first in simulation. Um, I'll show you three videos with three different control strategies. So the first one I'm going to show you is when there is no safety uh, controller that is happening. So it's just tracking the desired plan only. There is a uh, safety term in the planner's objective, but as I, as I said earlier, this competes with other planning objectives. So safety is not treated in the strict sense. So in this video, the red car is the robot car. So it's the autonomous car here. And the green one is human driven. So I'm actually ho um, holding an Xbox controller and driving this human, this car. And you will see a bunch of lines coming out of the human. And these represent the robot's prediction of what the human's going to do. And you'll also see a line coming out of the red car, which is the robot's planned trajectory. So I'll, I'll just play this video and this will make sense. Oh, by the way, this uh, white contour represents the avoid set that, um, that um, I was talking about. This is where your value is negative inside the set. So as you can see, planning and um, yeah, the robot's planning, but then at some point the human driven car like swerves into the robot and the robot tries to slow down a little bit, but obviously it couldn't slow down fast enough and hard enough for it to avoid a collision. So that's really obvious there's a collision that has happened. Um, right, there's like collision here. Okay, the next controller is the switching controller. So this is the kind of typical way that Hamilton Jacoby reachability is used where your system will switch to the optimal collision avoidance control. Um, so again, I'll play this. So you can see as the human swerved into it, um, the robot did a really big swerve and break to the point where it has just like gone off the road. Um, as you see there. Um, so I'm going to uh, pause it on this slide here, on this time here. So you can just see how much it has deviated from, from the road. Obviously, it has deviated a lot from its desired trajectory. Um, you know, if there was a road boundary on the side, like obviously this would be unideal. It would have just crashed into the wall. And now I'm going to present our proposed approach, which is where we treat safety as a constraint to the broader optimization problem. Um, I'll play it. And so you can see that the robot does swerve, does swerve and avoid a collision, but just enough to stay safe and it very quickly gets back on track to complete the interaction. And so let me play that again. Cool. Um, so. So just to kind of compare the amount of kind of deviations or excursion it has gone through compared to the switching case, um, like our one kind of barely gets off the road because it, it's able to avoid a collision just enough to stay safe. Um, and so this is why we call our controller a minimally interventional 
safety controller um, because um, it's still trying to optimize for planning performance, but knows how to kind of deviate just to stay uh, from its desired plan just to stay safe. Um, and the next thing we did was to test this on a full scale vehicle. Um, so we were very fortunate to collaborate with the Stanford Dynamic Design Lab, who had this really awesome, um, unique, one of a kind vehicle. Um, it's a vehicle that was built over the course of like more than a decade by kind of grad students and undergrads. Um, and so X1 here, this, that's the name of the car, X1 played the role of the autonomous car. Um, no one would really give us a second car for us to drive and try and swerve into X1. So we did what we did instead was we still had a virtual human driven car. And you can see me here um, being a safety driver and another student, Ed, who's actually holding an Xbox controller, controlling the human driven car that's swerving into X1, where we're, which we're sitting in. So it was, um, it gave me a lot of motion sickness, but the experiments were worth it. Um, and so we did a bunch of trials using this setup, use, um, using the three different control strategies. So the tracking only, switching, and what we're proposing. Um, and so, we found that our approach gave us a good balance between safety and efficiency. Um, so in terms of safety, we kind of measured how the total, how much it, the value function was negative. So kind of very quickly, although reachability, reachability theory kind of guarantees that we will stay safe um, and that technically our value should never drop below zero, there is a lot of model mismatch between the dynamics we used to compute the value function and the dynamics on the real system, right? There's a lot, of course, there's a lot of model mismatch. Um, you can't just naively increase your modeling fidelity when you compute the value function because reachability analysis get, uh, suffers from the curse of dimensionality. Um, but this is why sometimes our value is below zero. And in terms of efficiency, we use the average G-force that the car experienced, and this is meant to measure passenger comfort. And so this is what we refer to as like efficiency. And so, yeah, we did a bunch of trials and then we plotted the safety and efficiency to kind of see where we sat along this trade-off. So obviously we wanna be on the top right corner where we're the most efficient and the safest, but that, like obviously that's really hard to achieve. Um, so we can see in the switching case in this orange, yellow, dots um, we are the least efficient but the safest um, on average like we have the highest um, safety value um, for the kind of tracking only case the one without safety control um, you can see that we are the most efficient but in terms of safety there really isn't any like assurances from that in this approach um, we could be very safe or very unsafe it just depends because this interaction is um, stochastic. And then you can see our approach in the green dots, we sit right in the middle. Um, you know, we're more efficient than the switching case, a little less than the red dots. But in terms of safety, we're you know, pretty high, maybe on average a little lower than the switching case. But as you can, and so this is what I mean that by we, that we achieve a good balance between safety and efficiency. We, we sit right in the middle here. Um, and then finally, um, I mean, this is kind of just for fun. We did an experiment with the human car where the human car was uh, an RC car, um, just to show like this works um, with like a physical second car. But again, no one would give us a real full scale second car. Um, but here we were using, um, we were like tracking the RC car online. So there's a bit of kind of, perception uncertainty through the pipeline, but our method, like our method was still pretty robust to this. So I'll just play it now. So just I'll pause it. Um, so you can see this like a RVs visualization of what's happening. And I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but there's a tiny little RC car right next to um, X1 here. And then you can see the RC car swerves into it, but the, um, X1 is able to swerve and actually speed up to try and get ahead of it um, and was able to successfully avoid a collision and change lanes 
as well. Cool, I just like to show this video. <laughs> um, okay, so now the final question is like, is this enough to guarantee safety? Um, unfortunately, the sh short answer is no. I mean, there's a lot of kind of procedures that one needs to go through to kind of rigorously guarantee safety. But as I mentioned before, there is a model mismatch between the dynamics you use to compute the value function and you know, the dynamics on the actual car. And that is you know, kind of inevitable. This is true for many, many applications. But one thing that we can improve on is to make sure that your planner and controller are kind of agree with each other, right? You could have a case where the planner for some reason is telling your robot to run into a wall but obviously your safety controller or this HJ reachability controller would tell your robot not to run into the wall. And so there's gonna be a lot of conflict. Um, and I'll just touch on very lightly here, but you know, we, did, we did some work um, in our ROS paper this year where we um, actually took the value function and put it as a term in our planning objective. And this, was allowed, and, and this enabled the robot to avoid regions where inevitable collision was to occur under the worst case disturbance. And we found that there were less, um, less conflict between the planner and the controller, which resulted in kind of more efficient and smoother behaviors. But I can talk more about that um, after the talk if you're interested. Now, moving on to the second half of my talk, um, you know, which is trying to answer the question, how do we incorporate human knowledge when modeling interactions? So first I'll talk about why we'd want to do this and then I'll give an overview of what signal temporal logic is. And then finally, how we can use STL or signal temporal logic as a way to provide logical structure into different components of our autonomy stack. Um, so going back to the autonomous driving example, obviously there's a lot of road rules that govern how these agents or these cars should interact with each other. Of course, there are, you know, people do break the rules and there's a lot of variations in how these rules are obeyed. Um, but regardless, there is this, these rules do provide some structure into how these interactions should play out. Similarly, um, this could, the same could be said for urban air mobility applications where you have drones, aircraft, flying taxis, you know, they're flying around interacting with each other, but they also, need to obey air traffic rules and, um, and having this structure can really help make the, may help streamline the design of your autonomy stack. And it can also, by knowing these rules, it can also help an autonomous agent detect when someone is not following the rules. Um, and then you can you know, have extra things in your autonomy stack that would account for these situations. And, and so, I mean, the point here is that there's a lot of structure that us as humans know about the interaction and we would like to translate and transcribe these, kind of, these structure in, when we are designing the autonomy stack of our autonomous agents. And to this end, I've been looking into using signal temporal logic as this, um, as this language that enables us to do that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with signal temporal logic, um, but um, I'll try to keep it brief um, in case you're uh, experts in this already. Um, okay, so signal temporal logic, there's three words, right? The first word, let's, let's look backwards. L look at these words backwards. So logic, I um, assume most of you would be familiar with, with logic, right? Like you, this is what you use when you're coding an if statement in programming, right? You have propositions and you want maybe one proposition to be true or you can combine two propositions through like an and or or command you can also do the negation so this is what we mean by logic um, the second word temporal just means that we can um, reason about these logical propositions over time um, so rather than looking at them at a at a single instance in time we can reason about them over a time interval and then finally, the signal part just means that we are um, talking about, we are uh, evaluating or looking at these logical statements 
over real valued signals. So the signal could be like your trajectory coming out of your robot as it moves through space and time. And, and these are real valued numbers. Okay, so this is, yeah, this, uh, in a nutshell, this is what signal temporal logic is. Um, as I said, STL, signal temporal logic, is a type of light logical language. So with any language, it comes with a set of grammar. And the grammar, if you read some of the papers, will look something like this. It has all these bunch of symbols that tell you how to, how to kind of combine more uh, signal temporal logic formulas together. Um, the, if you haven't seen this before, the kind of these, this notation might kind of look a bit weird, but the, uh, the nice thing about it is like there's a very kind of literal English translation to each of these um, operators. So the way you would uh, create an STL formula is you would start with this predicate, which basically says you have a function mu um, evaluated for a particular value x in your signal, and you want this to be less than c, where c is a number. So now you have this predicate, and then you can then combine it with an other predicate. So if you had two pre predicates, you could say predicate one and predicate two. Um, you can also say not predicate, so it's the opposite of that, what, what, what this predicate tells you. And you can also define this over time. And this until operator just means you want the first, you want formula phi to be true until formula psi is true. And you want this transition to happen between the time interval a, b. Um, so yeah, basically the point I'm trying to get at here is that there's a very literal English translation to these operators. Um, and then you get, you can create a formula by just like kind of recursively combining these other operators on top of each other. So you can get a, you can arbit get an arbitrarily complex STL formula. Um, here are some examples of how you can compose these formulas together to get other kind of intuitive uh, operations such as or, right? If you have and, you can derive or, um, there's the implies. And then I think more importantly, you can get the eventually and always operator, which is literally, like it eventually means what you think eventually means, right? Eventually just means at some point in the future, you want the formula phi to be true. And for always, it's like over this time interval, you want the formula phi to always be true in this time interval. And so this is um, what signal temporal logic looks like and what it means. Um, there's a very obvious English translation to it. Um, so let me give you a more concrete example on how you would create a formula. Um, suppose you had a signal ST, which is a, maybe the positions of your robot indexed in time. So you have X, Y positions. So yeah, to create a formula, you would start with a predicate. Y is greater than 10. So it would represent this region here. And you want X is less than five. So it would represent this region. You could say you always want to be in this region for five time steps. But then you can also say eventually always be inside this region for five time steps, right? Eventually means you know you don't want don't have to be in there at the beginning, but at some point in the future that needs to be true. And then you can combine it with the until operator. Um, say okay, first I want the first part to be true until the second half is true, and the second half here is saying eventually I want to be in this orange region here. So I mean this example is just a toy example, there's no real interpretation to this, but this is just to show you how you can construct an STL formula by recursively combining these operations together. Um, and as you can see, if you had a particular road rule, road rule in mind, you could construct a similar formula in this, in this fashion. But now you have this signal and this formula, a very natural question to ask is, does the signal satisfy the formula? And this would give you a yes or no answer or a Boolean, right? One or zero. A more informative question um, or a question with a more informative answer would be, how much does the signal satisfy or violate the formula, right? It's one thing to know yes or no, but maybe you wanna know, does it satisfy like just a little bit or like a lot? 
and knowing this number can um, can be useful to see how robust um, your signal is with respect to the formula, right? Because that can tell you, okay, if I wiggled my formula a little bit, um, does the form is the formula still true? You know, how much can I wiggle until I violate the formula? Um, and so this is what we mean by robustness. Um, so you could imagine if the signal was the output of a neural network, you could ask a similar question. How much do I like perturb my neural network so that the output still satisfy the formula? Alternatively, if the if the signal is the output of a policy, you know, how much can you change the policy before you violate the formula? And so, um, and so, yeah, you can start to think about kind of maybe the derivatives of this formula, right? If I change the signal a little bit, how does that change my robustness? Um, but before we can do that, we need to first also understand how do we compute robustness? Um, there's actually, a, um, this thing called quantitative semantics, which actually tells you exactly how to compute the robustness formula. It's a set of formulas. Um, as I said before, these formulas are defined recursively. So you need to kind of recursively apply these max and mins, like, or it's like nested max and mins inside of each other, right? It, um, and so this can become really nasty really quickly. But the point is there is a formula that exists that allows you to compute a robustness formula. And so what I propose in this work is to evaluate these robustness formulas using computation graph or using kind of leveraging mature state-of-the-art computation graph software like PyTorch. And the way it goes is you have an STL formula. Um, you know, here it's just like a made-up formula. Um, you know, you can create this kind of syntax tree or the parse tree that tells you how to um, kind of the structure of this formula, right? The inside, the inner formulas are at the bottom, and then the last formula, which is eventually, is at the top. You can kind of flip these arrows around and see that. Okay, well, if I passed in the robustness values of the of these of the bottom formulas, and then pass it into the next operator, and the next operator, and then the next operator, then I can get the robustness value of the entire formula. Um, you know, and then computing this can be done on a computation graph. So you can create a really large computation graph that would spit out your robustness formula. And the nice thing about computation graphs or leveraging existing computation graph software, you could put in a batch of signals and you can output a batch of robustness values. So you can kind of do this very efficiently. And in my work, I kind of described how you can translate an STL formula into this computation graph. Um, oh, and you can, with this computation graph, you can also do backpropagation through it. And this whole process is what I detailed in my work, my wafer paper, um, and I call this STL CG. Um, and so there's a, um, like a toolbox you can use that can, where you can write down an STL formula, and this is like done in PyTorch. Um, and then you can get the robustness formula very, very efficiently and very quickly, and for a lot of input signals. Um, so let me show you some examples of like uh, how we can use this in in a couple of kind of examples. So the first example is just motion planning. Suppose you have this robot that wants to get to the destination. Maybe this robot wants to visit the cows only on one run, and then on another day it just wants to visit the sheep before going to the final destination. And so you can you know, come up with some formulas that describe it. Um, you know, first you wanna be inside the red box for five time steps, then the green box for five time steps, um, but stay outside this uh, blue circle. And then you can also have some control constraints on your robot. Um, but ultimately you can kind of translate the task that you want as an STL formula. And then you can, create an unconstrained optimization problem where you have a term that kind of penalizes uh, errors in your dynamics. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to minimize the negative robustness, right? Because we want to maximize robustness. Um, and, you know, just put that in as a loss term. And, um, and then you can just do very vanilla gradient descent. And then very easily and very quickly, we can get these um, kind of 
paths or uh, trajectories for your robot to follow that actually satisfies the STL formula. So for one of them, you can see it first goes into the red box uh, for you know, some five time steps, and then it goes into the green box for five time steps. It avoids the blue circle, and then it also gets to the end. And the same for the other formula. And it's just very easily we can do this. I mean, this is not anything that complex, but I'm just kind of show, showing you that with STLCG, you can just apply very vanilla, um, your, your favorite gradient descent algorithm on it. Um, the next example um, I think is kind of more exciting is you can actually regularize your loss function when you're um, training a neural network. Uh, so when you're training a neural network, you can add an additional re regularization term where you want to maximize or minimize the negative robustness. So in this very simple example, suppose you want to learn a neural network that would fit this kind of signal here. You, you want to do some fitting. Um, but, you know, maybe your data collection process is really noisy and, you know, uh, it has all these noise in it. But maybe based on th this fake application, um, you know that the signal between time steps one and three um, has to be in between this region here. But because it was very noisy, that was not the case. So training a neural network um, with an additional regularization term which is the robustness of the formula, very easily you can have it so that it does satisfy that um, this formula where your signal is in between the two dotted lines here. Um, so nothing fancy was done. I just literally added an additional term to my loss function, which was related to the robustness of the formula I wanted my, my model to satisfy. Another uh, example here is um, kind of sequence to sequence prediction. So suppose you had um, some data that gave you a history, like a trajectory history, and you wanted to predict the trajectory, the future trajectory. Um, so yeah, so given this kind of green trajectory, you want to predict the blue trajectory and there's a bit of noise in it. Um, so if you just kind of trained an RNN or a current neural network and Made, and the loss was just to minimize like the L2 norm, um, the error of the green, of the blue trajectory. Um, your long-term behavior would be something kind of uncontrolled, right? It would just be whatever it was. But maybe again, for some reason in this example, you know that the long-term behavior had to be in between these dotted lines. So what we can do is we can just add this regularization term. And then we can see by doing that, we're able to, to um, still you know, be able to predict the short-term behavior, but also satisfy the long-term behavior, even though we didn't have any data on the long-term behaviors. Um, and so you could see how this could apply to maybe autonomous driving. You, you can predict how someone is gonna change lanes, but maybe you know that they're gonna end up in the lane in the next 10 seconds, but you don't have data or it's very hard to train um, train your model for such long time horizons. Um, okay, cool. So but again, like these examples are just to show you how we can use STLCG in a variety of um, kind of learning based problems and even motion planning. Uh, how am I going for time? Oh, okay. Um, so I'll just wrap up very quickly. So in the last point was about connections between points one and two. Um, so there was work in our lab a few years ago that actually found a connection between hamilton jacobi reachability and signal temporal logic. Um, cool. Um, so this connection that they showed was the equivalence relationship. So as I talked about earlier, um, about when I talked about reachability, we were talking about how to avoid a particular region, but you, there's like a similar formulation you could come up with that told you how you can reach a particular region, or you can reach a region while avoiding another region. And these are all the variations of the reachability problem. But the parallel is that with STL, you know, if you want to avoid something, you can just say you always want to stay outside something. And if you want to reach something, that's just the same as saying eventually I'll get there. And then the reach avoid is actually equivalent to the until operator. You want to avoid the blue region until you are inside the red region. 
And so there was these equivalents between reachability and STL. And what that meant is that if you had an STL formula you wanted your system to satisfy, you could synthesize a control by converting it into a reachability problem and getting the control that way. Um, I think I'll skip this just for the sake of time, but this is just an example to show uh, a specific example of what of this connection. Um, but essentially, yeah, uh, in this work, they had a connection between STL with Hamilton Jacoby reachability. And then what I proposed in like the second part of my talk was, well, if you had an STL formula, we can use STL CG to um, evaluate these formulas on a computation graph. But if you have a computation graph, um, you can also relate this to deep neural networks, as I showed you um, in my, two, uh, in my uh, examples. And so there's a connection here. And so I think what's really interesting for future work is like, well, is there a connection between deep neural networks and Hamilton Jacobi reachability? Uh, you know, maybe we want to compute the value function of a really high dimensional system. Could we approximate the value function using deep neural networks, which is then regularized by STL and that STL formula corresponds to the original reachability problem. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot of kind of interesting connections that we could study and also applications that could be really interesting. Um, just to summarize kind of the key takeaways of my talk. So the first question um, we wanted to answer was how do we ensure safety without unduly impacting interaction performance? And the answer was use a HJ safety preserving control constraint. The second question was like, how do we incorporate human knowledge when modeling interactions? And the answer was use SCLCG within gradient based techniques. And then finally, as I just kind of very quickly <laughs> went through, it was like these interesting connections between reachability and STL. And I think, um, and yeah, the, these are the kind of things I'm thinking about um, kind of over the um, right now. So, um, of course, I couldn't have done this alone. There were a lot of people that were helping me from the theory to experiments, even to helping me with this presentation. So, I just want to give them a shout out. Um, here is a related publications um, on the things that I talked about. And I'm happy to take any questions. I, sorry, didn't leave a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Very interesting. No worries for the time. We have some extra minutes. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Um... Let me try to activate the video. Okay. Hello, Karen. Thank Hello. you very much for the interesting talk. Thank you. So I have a question regarding the approach uh, of using um, this reachability sets. Um, how does it, let's say, you know that you might run into the problem of having the, the frozen robot, which seems a very, very, let's say, typical for, for these scenarios where, for example, you're driving on a highway and you you cannot exclude the case of the, the guy next to you swerving into you. So yeah. how, how do you deal with this problem? So when basically you, you cannot, uh, you, you have a, an infeasible constraint. Right, so um, that, that's a really good question. So actually in some of the experiments, we couldn't like, we couldn't, both cars couldn't really be on the center of their lanes because the reachable set was kind of like fat and it overlapped a bit. Um, so it is definitely a problem. Um, so, um, so mathematically, um, when, when you do have maybe like you are boxed in, there's a slack variable you can use to, I mean, you're going to violate it, but you want to violate it minimally. So that's like the mathematical kind of um, quick answer. Um, a different answer is like, um, you can, so I think what, so the way we computed the reachable set was like just based on collision states. So if you were in collision, um, that was bad, but this, sh you could define your uh, terminal set differently. You could actually incorporate velocity information and this can actually change the shape um, of this uh, value function to make it thinner, right? If you're moving really fast, it's harder to swerve into the car that's next to you because you will just kind of um, you, you by the time you've passed like by the time you swerve you would have passed the other car and so yeah changing the way you can you define the 
terminal set can affect the shape of your value function. And then that can um, also change how, uh, like maybe mitigate some of these kind of situations where um, you're too timid from the other car. Um, another answer is actually, I think it's interesting is like um, actually learning from data, like how, to what extent do human drivers actually obey the, these value functions? And maybe we can get some insights from driving data to see, okay, in these situations, you don't, um, they're fine, but in these like kind of awkward situations, the value function is really important. Um, another interesting thing is um, rather than at, at the planning level, rather than um, actually, sorry, either in the planning or control level, but like maybe you don't want to react when you're immediately at the boundary, but maybe at, if you're in the boundary for some amount of time, then you want to maybe do something and maybe consider the integral of your value function over time rather than like a instance in time. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? I have one question. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the awesome talk. Thank you. Uh, one question maybe a little uh, related is uh, you mentioned that the value function is computed offline. Yes. But then in all the animations, we, we see it changing sort of online. Mm -hmm. so um, is it like pre-computed for some scenarios or? Hmm. Yes. Um, so the way you compute the value function is over um, the grid. So you, um, over your state, state, state space, you have like grid points. And that's why it actually scales um, exponentially, right? Like the bigger your states and the more grid points you have, it kind of yes. blows up. Um, but basically you have a value at each point in your state. Um, so as I'm running online, like as my state changes, I can just look up this giant grid of numbers um, and then look at what my value is. Um, so that's why it changes over time. Um, it changed over yeah. time because my states were oh. different over time. But yeah, I wasn't, it's okay. just a, like a lookup table essentially when you're doing it okay. online. Okay, so you pre-compute it for the whole state space and then you just pick it up from my IT. Yes, yes, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so in terms of reachability, like, you know, yeah, the offline computation is pretty like intensive, but you know, it's done offline. And online, it's very lightweight in the sense that you just look up a number. So um, it's really nice in that sense. The does it depend on both both agent states or just mine um it, so you yeah it, it depends on like basically you need to come up with a dynamics so um for the case where you have one agent like the bicycle running into the tree your dynamics would just be the agent but when you have two agents or more you need to actually compute or like write out the relative dynamics and the relative state because you care about the relative states yeah. and not really the absolute states. Um, and yes, so yeah, so it's, still, it's, still, uh, it's still in a way you want like just my state, but just uh, in a way. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it depends on your, the, the dynamics would be like a relative dynamics. Yeah. Um, and then your control would just be the robot's control. And then you treat the yeah. humans as the disturbance into um, into your system, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? I have one actually. Maybe maybe you do that, but uh, I, I haven't I haven't got it from the presentation. So when in the first part of your talk, when you are considering safety, um, are you actually considering hierarchies and the safety measures? I don't know. For example, you you are allowed to violate certain laws to not uh, to not crash into the vehicle. So is there is there some kind of, of order in the rules? Um, for sorry for the first for reachability or for STL? Yes, for the first part. First part. Um, so for uh, for what the stuff that I talked about, like no, I didn't really talk about hierarchies. 
but I mean, that depends on your plan, right? Like what I'm proposing with using reachability as a constraint, that's only applied to your low level controller. Um, it, ha it doesn't really care what your high level planner is telling your robot to do, right? As long as your robot has a trajectory to follow and there's a low level controller that tells you how to follow it, um, what I'm proposing should work. Um, but your planner could be something like, it doesn't care what your planner is. So your planner could have this hierarchy. Right, right, I see. So yeah. it's, it's compatible with, the, with any, any kind of planner you, of high level planner you have. Exactly, right? Yeah, your high level planner could have like multiple parts or whatever. But yeah, as long as you're, there's a low level controller that tells your robot how to follow that plan, um, I guess, yeah, technically this HJ reachability stuff should apply. All right, very nice. Thank you. Thanks. Any closing question? If not, I would. Uh, I think you guys uh, got the contacts for Karen. If you have any any further question, you can reach out to her. And Karen, I would like to thank you for the great talk. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you and, for having uh, me. It was it was great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and um, see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Thank, thank you very everyone. much.